Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm Vin Sapola, president of the Municipal Arts Society. And uh, we are here to discuss equitable wireless internet access in New York City. Uh, and this is an important issue to MAS for several reasons. Uh, Wi-Fi is an essential part of urban planning. Researchers and city officials increasingly use GIS and GPS data to plan intelligent and responsive cities. Urban environments need to respond to user patterns in real time to run more smoothly and more efficiently in every community. And not only is that the smart thing to do, it is a necessity in our rapidly changing world. Uh, Wi-Fi is also an important day-to-day -day livability issue for New Yorkers as advances in internet speed and wireless technology have encouraged a shift to providing informational services online. If you want to know how the latest blizzard, and this has been one winner for blizzards, is affecting our transit system, mta.info is only clicks away. Uh, banking transactions, healthcare coordination, and other typically cumbersome activities have now been streamlined to save time and money. Millions of New Yorkers have been able to go about their daily tasks with increased efficiency and simplicity. In Manhattan, successful public-private partnerships between business improvement districts and internet providers have brought wireless technology to a number of public spaces, including Union Square and Bryant Park, as well as Times Square and various locations in Lower Manhattan through the Downtown Alliance. These are encouraging steps in the right direction, but access to these services is far from universal, as we all know. According to a 2007 Pew Internet in American Life project, nearly two-thirds of people living in New York City lacked access to affordable high-speed broadband. How effective are online surveys targeting important livability concerns, such as MAS's uh, survey on livability, um, that miss over half of the population? How much more efficient is online banking if the majority of residents would rather wait in line than wait for a sluggish internet connection? In working towards a more livable New York, it is crucial that we address why such disparities exist and what steps we can take to provide access to those currently lacking it. Urban areas have attempted citywide access before Philadelphia, and we'll hear a little bit about this this evening, uh, launched a municipal wireless system in 2006, but has not been able to sustain the program. Other cities have rolled out variations of the Philadelphia plan with varying success, and we're here tonight to discuss how to make it work for New York. What could equitable, equitable access across the boroughs enable us to do better, more efficiently, and more cost effectively? What are the positives and potential negatives to our current system of public space wireless access? What are the roles of, this, of city government, bids, and the private nonprofit developers in providing free Wi-Fi? I'd like to now turn over the stage to City Council Member Gail Brewer. Uh, Gail has worked tirelessly at the forefront of making city government more transparent and more proficient technologically, representing the great Upper West Side of Manhattan, where Gail, by the way, I'm now a resident, having crossed town from the east side. You are, this is my first public announcement of that. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the hood. Gail is the chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations and the former chair of the Committee on Technology and Government. Improving wireless access for all New Yorkers is one of her key campaigns, and I'm very pleased that she is here tonight to offer her remarks. Please join me in welcoming Gail Brewer. be calling me about a pothole or something <laughs> very soon. Anyway, it's a real honor to be here. I think this is the second time in the last short time period that MAS has once again thought about these issues in terms of planning. And I really uh, appreciate it because there are po what I call posse people in the room. These are folks that have stuck with the city council's technology committee for a long time. And I think we get frustrated because it takes so long to get things accomplished. So when you see MAS and other organizations, you really feel good about the work that we're doing. Um, the technology committee um, had uh, hearings around the city based on a law that we passed talking about broadband. Many of you were there. And it came up just as uh, was mentioned earlier, the issue of cost. A lot of families, even today, as you perhaps more than ever, cannot afford technology, cannot afford the connection. And so one of the issues we've addressed over and over again is 
What is the role of the community? What's the role of those providing low-income housing? What's the role of schools and the home connection? What's the role of libraries, et cetera? It's an ongoing issue. And so that was the, the concern that continues. I know we heard a little bit about Wi-Fi hotspots, and we have some in this neighborhood, but it's, and you'll hear from some of the speakers, what's the role of the parks? How much should be available that's free? What about for seniors who are sometimes the last, but eager to get on for the grandchildren and jobs? And what about small businesses, many of whom are not online and don't see the necessity, interestingly enough? All of these were discussed. Along came then, good news, and others will talk about some federal money uh, from the stimulus money. And to the credit of the Department of Education, with many help from this room and help from others, I certainly helped put together a home to work opportunity, which is millions of dollars now being spent where middle school students and parents and uh, community groups work together to provide that continuity. And there are 100 middle schools and thousands of parents are showing up every Saturday in schools around the city to make that happen. Learning on the site at the school, going home with a computer brand new, loaded with extremely uh, good data and a free connection for a while from whatever the cable company is for your area. And the same or additional money for seniors through a group called OATS. A lot of senior centers will have the same opportunity. Of course, we wonder and we worry when the federal money runs out, how do we keep this going? And certainly, it doesn't meet all the needs. These are just some of the issues that we've been talking about. It's always cost. It's always speed. And of course, the on, just ongoing discussion of what's the device. Um, I think uh, you should just know now that I'm head of governmental operations, it's a, it, I'm still very involved with the technology committee, but it is interesting. Given and I've just come from Albany, where the whole city council was lobbying for senior funds, for education funds, for after school funds, for summer employment for young people, et cetera, all the human services. And constantly there's a, I don't know if it's a backlash, I don't know if the big tech contracts are not appropriately monitored and supervised, but you will hear all of my colleagues complaining, perhaps correctly, perhaps not, that every tech contract that's contracted out should not exist and the money should go to seniors and young people, et cetera. I don't know what's right, I don't know what's wrong, but I can just tell you as we're sitting here today thinking innovatively at the same time that's going on. Certainly the city time contract didn't help. The whole issue of security um, comes up. The police department uh, correctly has a very large contract, security in general, also for first responders to be able to communicate around the city. Um, but as that contract proceeds, it's expensive. So I just want to conclude by thanking MAS again because not only are you here today, but some years ago you worked with the community boards, our 59 community boards, and taught a lot of them how to get online. And um, I think you'll hear more, but the city has picked up the uh, mantle and uh, has now got a wonderful map where you can put in how many noise complaints in your neighborhood, you can find out how many potholes in your neighborhood, et cetera. And that's the kind of information that I think the city agencies are great at providing that can then help the public and those who care about public policy make better decisions. So I really appreciate that. I think we had something to do with it because we started the uh, push with Local Law 47, which said information has to be up online. A lot more to talk about. Open data is something that I've been pushing. I hope we'll have a bill in the near future where every database, not security, not personnel, not health records will be up available to the public in some kind of system that everybody can understand it. I'm being a little oversimplifying, but I'm saying that the administration, the council are working on it together and I think that would be great, not just for developers, but my first love, which is for public information, should be available to the public. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gail, for being here. And as Gail mentioned, she made the trip down from Albany to make it here this evening. So thank you so, so much. And if you just joined us, welcome. Um, we're very pleased that you're here. And if you are new to MAS, I do hope that um, you'll get to know us better and explore our website and look at our advocacy agenda. We are very happy to, to, uh, to, to meet you and have you. 
And also I want to thank um, New York IT. This is a terrific facility. Some of us remember it when it was a movie theater. Uh, we were chatting earlier, a few of us, that it seemed to be the movie theater would get like the movie like a month after it closed everywhere else. And there was never anyone here, so you could come and be by yourself. Um, and um, which is pathetic, but, but some of us did do that. <laughs> but uh, they, NYIT has done a, a marvelous job, and I know that uh, NYIT has been a, a tremendous uh, asset to this neighborhood, as it is a great, great asset to the city of New York. Um, I'm delighted to have Rachel Stern here tonight as our keynote speaker. Mayor Bloomberg appointed Rachel the city's first uh, chief digital officer, CDO, uh, earlier this year. Do they call you CDO? No, Chief Digital Officer, okay. This is the first time the city has hired someone, appointed someone to streamline digital media communications across a broad array of city agencies. Uh, she is tasked with helping make NYC.gov more user friendly, ensuring that agencies integrate social media opportunities and serving as an advocate for the digital media industry. Rachel is also the founder of Ground Report, a pioneering civic journalism portal that enables citizens to report news through firsthand articles, videos, and photos. It is my great pleasure to welcome Rachel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vin, for that introduction. Um, I'm deeply honored to be here, um, and I want to thank the Municipal Arts Society. I also want to thank and recognize um, Council Member Brewer for her tireless efforts to help um, pursue technology and, and um, the needs of New Yorkers in that respect. Um, and I'm very honored and excited um, to see um, what our esteemed panelists um, have to say about the issue. Um, as Vin said, I am new to the government space, and so this is very exciting. I'm also very excited to see this focus on the digital aspect of urban planning, which I think is um, only going to grow. Um, my role as chief digital officer really focuses on um, the layer of digital um, media that enables interaction between the government and the public. Um, just to give you a bit of context. And, and I started just over a month ago. So what I'm going to start um, just to, to talk about before this panel is sort of the content of why it is important that we're connected. Why does digital matter? Um, how does that actually um, help to support the goals of a healthy democracy? Um, and in terms of recommendations and next steps, I'll start now by sort of um, giving a little preview that um, in, in early May, I will be announcing um, the recommendations for where we can take um, our city's sort of digital, digital roadmap and digital future to come. So for now, I'm going to focus on what are we doing digitally, how does that enable a healthy democracy, um, and why is that important? So this is a, this is a quick look at... Um, basically how digital can enable um, in engagement um, between citizens and the government. And you see that if, if you look on the far left side, it's a, it's a pretty simple, straightforward thing. And this is how the citizens' mind work. If you look all the way on the right side, it's a mess of, 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 um, of different departments, and not all of them intersect, and some of them do, and some of them aren't actually part of the city, and others are. Um, and I think that's why it's important um, that we have tools like 311, which everyone recognizes and is, is widely lauded for helping to, to make this um, a much more um, sort of comfortable experience to engage with government. Um, but digital media tools also help to serve that purpose. Um, the top one, of course, is NYC.gov, which is really the city's presence that, that sits between um, the government and the public. 311 online has been expanded enormously as of late and is doing a few things that I'll show you in just a moment. The NYC data mine, that's related to the open data sets and the release of public information that Council Member Brewer was talking about. And then there are even third party sites like Facebook and Twitter, which may seem very frivolous, but in reality, this is where people are, are living and socializing online. And if there's an opportunity to engage with them there, um, it, 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 could, it could help to serve um, more effectively. So as an analogy to sort of drive home how the digital space is important, I thought it was interesting to look at comparing a public uh, physical space with a public digital space. 
So on the left we have Central Park, um, which is a public physical space that, that many people can enjoy, um, is subsidized by the city and other organizations. On the right we have NYC.gov. Um, so you can compare them in many different ways. In terms of visitors, they're not so far off. Um, Central Park gets 35 million visitors a year. NYC.gov gets about 25 million visitors a year. In terms of how you access the actual space, um, Central Park has dozens of entrances, different ways you can access it from the street. NYC.gov, by contrast, has hundreds of thousands of entrances, and that's because it's indexed by search engines like Google and Bing so that you can enter it at many different points. Um, Central Park has limited space. There's only, there's only so much real estate to work with there. Um, NYC.gov is infinite. You will never run out of pages to put up. You can always add content. You can always add space. And that's a really interesting um, contrast to look at how can we leverage that and take advantage of it. NYC.gov is also open all the time, like, like digital resources, assuming the website is up, um, whereas uh, physical spaces have hours because they have staffs. Um, and the middle piece that I think is an interesting contrast is the role of the public. Now, of course, Central Park is a space for recreation, so you're supposed to be consuming. Um, and in that context, the public really only fills the role of the consumer, although the public could also be volunteering and helping. But there's not, there's not really much to sort of build on. When you consider the role of the public in NYC.gov, by contrast, you're not only allowing them to be a consumer, but also a producer. Um, and this is because in opening up things like um, open data sets from very, various agencies, putting it in a format that developers can build on top of it and create um, business models and also create useful tools, we, we start to see the potential of the collaboration that can happen between um, the public sector and the private sector and citizens. Um, and I think that there's a, there's a lot of potential there that's enabled by digital media that we haven't been able to explore um, up to this point. And the last pieces are just that um, both require um, stewards. Both require people who are managing and making sure that everything's happening. And in both cases, the public can tell if there is a dedicated staff, if there are people who care and are making sure um, that facilities are maintained and kept clean and, and graffiti and negative comments, um, those are sort of the, the two analogies, are, are being kept out. So those are important in both cases, although the staff and the stewards who are committed to Central Park are greatly wider than um, perhaps the number of community managers we have for NYC.gov, though we're expanding those with many of the social media managers at city agencies. And finally, Central Park is free. You may have to pay a small cost to get there, but to enter and to enjoy the facilities um, in general, you don't have to pay any kind of fee. Whereas with digital resources like NYC.gov, there is a cost, whether it's your, your cell phone bill because you're using it on a smartphone, you're accessing broadband at home, um, and this sort of ties into the questions that will be addressed in the panel. A quick look at why um, Digital, digital resources could be seen as supporting and helping to foster a healthy uh, democracy. I think these are some of the most important points and things that I'm going to be focusing on in my digital roadmap um, for New York City and the 90-day report. Number one is that it's helping to inform the public. Um, and an informed public helps to make better decisions. They're more aware of what's going on around them. And they can help to push for more uh, responsible uh, legislation. Number two is that um, when when there's this engage, engagement with citizens, there also creates the opportunity for government to respond. And that's really important. So it's not just putting the message out there, but getting feedback back and creating a situation where you have to follow up on it. Um, the third piece is something that we all deal with. So having a more comfortable, um, accessible customer user experience, getting what you want and when you want it, not having to run around and having to navigate um, a difficult structure to get it. Thir uh, let's see, fourth. Um, there's the cost savings. And as Council Member Brewer mentioned, when you're looking at um, um, funding some of these initiatives, you have to be aware that, um, that, that it's really important how we allocate these resources. And one of the most exciting things about open data is that you create opportunities that create economic opportunities, for instance, for your technology partners and private sector partners. Um, but that also can ultimately create solutions to government problems that don't require taxpayer funds. So we're helping to reduce costs, enable innovation, um, and, and, and help to create much needed services. And finally, transparency and accountability. Um, just at the core of a really healthy democracy is seeing how everything's going so that, so that you can engage in a positive way. 
And I'll go really quickly just through a few ways the city's doing it, doing these things in an exciting way. So an informed public. Number one, for um, a couple of years now, um, the Office of Emergency Management has had um, notify NYC SMS alerts. They only, they only contact you with the most important things. You get it directly to your mobile phone, um, and it's been incredibly important, especially in things like weather emergencies. Recently, just about a couple of weeks ago, um, the mayor and the um, commissioner of the Department of Buildings announced that we would now be having um, QR codes, which is that funny looking square in the top right corner. Um, it's basically a two-dimensional barcode that when you scan it on your smartphone, you instantly get a whole bunch of context about what you're looking at. In this case, and as uh, the commissioner uh, Lamandry mentioned, New Yorkers are nosy. They want to know what's going on, especially if, for instance, there's a noisy construction site nearby. In this case, you can pull this information up, immediately call the, the, the manager of the construction site and see prior, um, prior violations. And we think it's information that New Yorkers deserve to have. Recently, um, the Parks Department also launched this partnership with something called Broadcaster that allows you to get uh, mobile walking tours of, of Central Park um, on any kind of uh, smartphone. It's, it was at no cost to the city, and it's really, really interesting. I actually list, started listening to one and ended up listening to all of them. It's absolutely phenomenal. So those are all about how we can add context and information to the physical environment. You only have so much space on a poster or a handout. Um, those are costly. Those affect the environment. But when you have these digital tools, you can start to basically hyperlink and add digital information to the physical environment. Um, the next quick things I'd like to highlight is engagement with citizens. So last week, um, the mayor's office rolled out um, question and answer opportunities with the public where people over Twitter could ask their questions and he responded to about five of them the next day on a radio show. It's just one step, but it's important because this is a channel of communication with access from um, an individual in the public to a representative that previously didn't exist and has been enabled by social media. We also have been um, recruiting and uh, soliciting feedback on, um, on money-saving ideas. This is um, one of the initiatives that Deputy Mayor Goldsmith has as part of his Simplicity Initiative, collecting these ideas and then publishing them for, to give some recognition to the best ideas to save money, to say, you know, maybe you have ideas that we could be implementing. And informally, as I've begun in this role, we've been starting to use um, social media tools. Quora, um, Q-U-O-R-A.com, is a well-known question and answer platform that has a really high level of sort of sophistication. And I put out the call, and we have, um, we've, we've, we've got over 40 answers, as you see there, um, really thoughtful ideas and a lot of engagement in terms of what we can do. Um, and and some, of the, uh, some of the concepts I, I suspect will be coming up tonight. In terms of service and support, um, through 311, uh, there's already been a lot of engagement in that front. And now the next step is, how can we start to do this in a digital context um, to make, to, to lessen the load, first of all, in our call centers, but also to make it easier for you to get your, to get your complaints out there and, and to not make this be a big part of your life. This summer, um, the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications rolled out this 311 iPhone app that lets you report problems on the go, things like potholes and noise complaints. Um, it hugely simplifies a process that otherwise might take you a much longer amount of time, and you can tag it with your location and add a photograph right wherever you are. We also have over 100 social media channels um, currently being run on everything from Facebook to Twitter, um, Flickr and Tumblr. Um, some of these may be foreign to you, some you may know. The idea is that instead of um, requiring everyone to come to us on nyc.gov, the city is already starting to come to where the people are, where they are socializing and living online and, and, doing, and engaging on their terms. You can see the whole list at that address there of, of the different social media platforms. Um, 311 has also started to respond to people via Twitter. Twitter is a microblogging platform that people can use to sort of share any kind of feedback about what's happening in their lives, but this is a very functional use of that because um, here we see one happy customer who had reported it and a week later um, also supporting transparency showed that 311 had responded to their tweet, um, um, you know, accelerated, escalated their concern and it was already resolved within a week. Another exciting thing that happens when you create these spaces is that um, sometimes 
the city actually ceases to own them. And this, was a, this is a really exciting example. So the Department of Health created this Facebook page um, for tips for quitting. And what it evolved into was sort of an online support group. And it really has become owned by the community. It's a really supportive, um, constructive dialogue that's happening there and starts to show that part of what digital media can engender is um, connecting people to each other so that they come up with solutions and, and, and serve each other instead of just government to public. And of course, it's always great to recognize people who are supporting um, programs and taking part in them. Um, Twitter, I mean, sorry, Flickr is, is another great photo sharing site where the de Department of Environmental Protection has a presence. Again, on open data, just to give a quick sense, um, I think today was actually the last day for voting in a competition for the best apps using the open data um, sets that were released by the city, 350 sets this year. And um, we've, we've seen not only useful tools be developed, um, but last year's winner, um, it was announced just a couple of weeks ago, got a $5 million investment from BMW, BMW's um, um, e-investment e arm that's, that's investing solely in mobile. So we're creating economic development opportunities in the city, um, we're releasing information which belongs to the public, um, and, and we're enabling innovation. Um, just to come back to the transparency piece, in terms of supporting a healthy democracy, as I mentioned in the beginning, this really allows the public to hold their government officials um, um, accountable. You can access this, 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 um, this map at the address below. It's the 311 service request map, also rolled out a couple of weeks ago. And what it does is it allows you to drill down to very specific complaints for any region in any of the five boroughs and see exactly how many have been, um, how many have been lodged, how many complaints and reports have been lodged, who has um, responded and who hasn't. And it's a great way to sort of um, amplify the voice of the public, um, especially the community boards, and to show what's happening and what's not. Another great one that you know might not seem very logical, but, but ended up being a, a, a huge success is the Department of Transportation's daily pothole tumbler. Every day they update to show how many um, potholes they've been updating, how they compared to their progress last year. Here's a map that shows all the potholes fixed just in the last month. Um, and it's been really great because it takes a subject that's maybe a bit stodgy and makes it very engaging and is also in a format um, that's just a bit more accessible. And the last piece, um, to all of this, of course, is that while New York City is in a great position um, and over 98% have access to broadband and um, as Council Member Brewer was mentioning, recently announced um, broadband for 18,000 sixth graders in schools that are labeled as, as hot, you know, high needs um, and, and that's been really, really fantastic for, for enabling and, and, and expanding that access. None of these tools really matter if there's not a complete democratic um, ability to access them both in terms of economic opportunity, 70% of, of job, of employers now only post jobs online, um, not just in terms of academics, where it's hugely important, but also in terms of, of being able to access the same services that everyone's getting. Um, and the last two comments are, are from um, our, the, communi the IT communications, sorry, the De Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications um, do it, uh, Commissioner Post comments on our focus on wireless and the need to support it and how it can support industry, et cetera. Um, but I'd just like to end again by saying that um, these innovations are all very exciting and I'm very excited to be a part of them. Um, but again, it comes down to can we all access them? Can we all access them in a democratic manner? And um, I look forward to seeing what our esteemed panelists are gonna say on that subject. So thank you very much. That was tremendous, Rachel. Thank you so much. And it was great to see um, the, the wonderful Eloise Hirsch and Fresh Kills featured in your broadcaster slide. So a little shout out to Staten Island and to Fresh Kills and to Eloise. Um, I would uh, now like to invite our panelists to come up. Uh, moderating the discussion this evening is Adam Balkin. Adam is currently the technology reporter for New York One. He started working as a writer for the station in 1997 and soon became a general assignment reporter. When New York One added a technology beat, his longstanding interests in the field made the opportunity a natural fit. Adam recently reported on President Obama's na national wireless broadband plan and has covered an array of different subjects in the technology field 
please join me in welcoming Adam on the panel. Come on up, Adam. On the panel, we have Greg Goldman, the Executive Director of the Delaware Valley Regional Economic Development Fund, which is the world's hardest acronym to say. From 2006 through 2010, Greg served as the CEO of Digital Impact Group, formerly known as Wireless Philadelphia. Uh, next, we have Sonia Murray, Senior Vice President of One Economy. Sonia manages the organization's strategic partnerships with corporations, nonprofits, and elected officials. She is responsible for developing and fostering relationships in local communities with both the public and private sector. And finally, Dana Spiegel serves as the executive director and a member of the board of directors of NYC Wireless, a New York City nonprofit organization that advocates and enables the growth of free public wireless networks. Please join me in welcoming our moderator and our panelists. Thanks, you guys. Thanks. We're gonna get right. First of all, I want to thank everyone for coming. Thank the Municipal Arts Society for bringing us here. I'm going to get right to it because a few weeks ago we had a conference call about what we would discuss, and I'm telling you, these three have so much information to share with us <laughs> that we can honestly learn from. I do want to mention three things, though. First off, as a point of disclosure, New York One is owned by Time Warner Cable, so we do have a little bit of a dog in this hunt. Uh, I'm not <laughs> in any respect an official representative here to speak on behalf of Time Warner Cable. I will be the journalist and try to remain uh, impartial. I just also want to mention my, my notepad is my iPhone, so if you see me referring to it, I'm not checking my email. I'm actually <laughs> doing stuff here. And I do have an alarm set for 740, which I was told is uh, 750. I don't know. We'll see when it goes off. That's a nice gentle strum, so it won't uh, interrupt too much. But when we hit that point, that then we will uh, take questions from the audience. First, bachelor number one. Okay. Uh, we are going to start with Greg because, as my history teacher always said, those who don't study history are doomed <laughs> to repeat it. So. Uh, not to judge up any bad memories, but it's let's talk to. about Philadelphia and what uh, what happened there that maybe didn't make it as successful as you would have hoped. And uh, are there lessons to be learned? I mean, are, are those hurdles hurdles that can be overcome in places here like New York City? Uh, great. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, the question. Thank you for the gentle <laughs> phrasing. I appreciate that. And the notes uh, for this meeting, it was uh, boldly, re boldly referred to as failure. Um, I, uh, I understand why that is. I've spent a lot of time on the therapist couch working on that, so I kind of <laughs> want to turn that around a little bit. I do have um, one uh, funny uh, thing, at least funny to me. I was uh, very happy, always uh, fun to, to be in New York to come up from, uh, to come up from Philadelphia. Uh, there was one uh, time around uh, two years ago, uh, or maybe three in March of uh, 2009, as the Wireless Philadelphia Project was going through another one of its um, heaves and hoes, that we actually had uh, a coverage uh, uh, from the, the New York Times. And there was a front page article on Saturday in March on the New York Times. This is the first time, first and only time in my whole life I've ever been in the New York Times. And not only on the, on the front page, there's a picture of me and the whole, you know, and the whole thing. And the headline, uh, you won't remember it, but I certainly do, is hopes fade for <laughs> wireless, for wireless cities. And I think to myself, there I am, my first time in the New York Times, and it's <laughs> under the headline, hopes fade. So, uh, what I do want to talk to you about a little bit is uh, what happened with Wireless Philadelphia. I'm going to assume that uh, a lot of folks in this audience have some familiarity with, uh, with the project. And so kind of flipping this whole thing about failure uh, around a little bit, I like to think of it uh, as uh, I'm not much of a technology person. I'm actually a social worker by training, but uh, I've learned a little bit of the lingo. And so I, I try not to call it failure. I try to think of it as the beta, right? <laughs> the beta for what we're all trying to accomplish now. So I want to start with actually, with the Wireless Philadelphia uh, project, the initiative, what actually was accomplished. And then I'll sort of peel that back a little bit and talk to you about what I think some of the lessons are. First of all, what was accomplished was a citywide network uh, that covers 80% of the habitable area of a citywide wireless network covering 80% of the habitable area of the city of Philadelphia. Uh, two sections of the city, for anybody who knows the community that weren't covered, uh, actually became politically problematic, but it, there were good reasons for it. Uh, the center city area, the downtown area, because there were fewer mounting assets for uh, wireless radios. There's decorative lighting and not the traditional uh, overhead uh, lighting that usually provides the power source uh, for the wireless radios. And then there's a section of the city that's quite hilly, 
uh, and uh, tree-lined, and it was very difficult to cover those areas. Unfortunately, that's the, those are the areas where most of the movers and shakers in the city of Philadelphia live, and so the fact that the network uh, never came to those areas and covered other segments of the city uh, became politically problematic uh, for it. But the network today exists. There's 27 high uh, towers covering the entire city, and 3,500 uh, wireless uh, devices uh, were deployed. $20 million of private capital was invested by uh, Earthlink, um, and the city uh, was able to purchase uh, those assets for uh, $2 million. Uh, and now uh, the network is deployed uh, for public safety and other public uses, and it actually formed the basis for the city, one of the city of Philadelphia's own applications to uh, the BTOP program, uh, the Broadband Technology Opportunity Program for uh, uh, public computer centers are going to be expanded on the back, one of the uses to be expanded on the back of this network. So it is successful in that regard. Additionally, I was personally involved in, uh, most uh, uh, passionately involved in the Digital Inclusion Program. And there I feel very uh, proud of the work that we did. Uh, we served uh, 2,000 uh, low-income uh, families. We influenced the National Broadband Plan uh, with research uh, that we had done. Uh, on the basis of that, I personally joined the team at BTOP that was responsible uh, for the distribution of about $450 million in uh, uh, broadband adoption grants uh, nationwide. And so uh, what we learned as a beta, I think, really helped uh, to uh, further uh, the whole issue of, um, of broadband adoption. Uh, this was an early program. It started really going all the way back to 2004. The initial build began uh, in 2006. And there's a whole history around this that had to do with Earthlink and its particular uh, di economic dynamics at the time. But as a result of the Wireless Philadelphia project, similar projects came on rapid succession in San Francisco, San Diego, Houston, Miami, Chicago, uh, and in other uh, major cities. And as a result, I feel, of the Wireless Philadelphia project and the energy uh, that was uh, generated for that, uh, a lot of these other projects and the whole conversation around uh, broader scale availability of wireless uh, broadband uh, really was <laughs> elevated. And lastly, uh, in terms of what was accomplished, and I think uh, something very, very important that doesn't get looked at a lot, is that at, by, at the exact moment that Wireless Philadelphia was announced in the city of Philadelphia, broadband prices dropped across the board. Mm -hmm. And it's very, I think, a, a sad uh, situation that not only was Earthlink coming into Philadelphia and offering lower prices, but that level of additional competition dropped prices. And we all know cost is not the only issue affecting um, uh, broadband adoption for low-income families uh, and, for, and for others, but it is certainly um, a really important issue. Um, so what was the project? It was a public-private partnership between uh, city government, a private enterprise, Earthlink, and a nonprofit organization called Wireless Philadelphia, which I uh, headed. It was intended to create uh, a citywide network, not a free network, but a low-cost network that would compete uh, in the private market and then also offer free access in some public spaces very similar, and I know Dana knows a lot um, about this. It was intended to address the cool factor, to try to make Philadelphia a cooler place, uh, not that we really need to be any cooler than we are, <laughs> but try to make it a cooler place to live. And our mayor at the time, interestingly enough, John Street, uh, doesn't get a lot of credit, uh, but he's a, an interesting uh, gentleman. He's an older gentleman. He's well into his 60s, perhaps even his early 70s now. He was in his 60s when he was mayor. But he's a technophile, and he himself understood uh, the power of technology and getting it into the hands of the neighborhoods. So it was an ambitious citywide project. It had a tremendous amount of political support. It had private capital driving uh, its expansion. It had a tremendous degree of public engagement. It even had media support, although uh, when I quickly turned to you know, what went wrong, the hype around this, as you all know, uh, was tremendous. Philadelphia Magazine uh, had a headline or a cover story calling it the biggest news in Philadelphia since 1776. <laughs> so when you realize that that's kind of the hype that you're living with, uh, you know 
everybody, New Yorkers, I'm sure, know better than anybody how we love to take things down once we've built them up. And so that had a lot to do with it. Uh, there's one other factor I wanted to mention, and another underappreciated factor, although I, I know s other panelists will have uh, similar issues. Uh, the utility had a tremendous uh, role to play in this, and I w don't mind saying, certainly out of town, that uh, not a great role to play. The utility was um, uh, very, very difficult. Mounting assets, uh, ma identifying mounting assets, the cost for mounting uh, wireless devices, um, w was extreme, and uh, I could use a more extreme word than that. But um, the utility has a tremendous role to play, and uh, they were not, uh, uh, they, they, they took their money, but they were not a partner. Um, okay, so what went wrong? Um, everything that I just told you that it had going for it turned against it. And uh, that is uh, uh, a very unfortunate reality. The political dynamics changed. Uh, we had uh, the fellow who, uh, who I was just talking about, Mayor Street, uh, was an unpopular mayor. And even though he, this was a popular program, he was an unpopular individual. And his own personal popularity waned. A new mayor came in. And it made it difficult to sustain the momentum uh, behind the project. Earthlink uh, came in offering its own money uh, to build this project out for its own reasons. But they uh, had. Uh, quite a great deal of difficulty in actually executing on the project. And so uh, while you know, it's very difficult to identify public sources for uh, uh, private sources for public good, uh, I would say that it's very important that you choose your private partner very carefully. And uh, I guess one lesson on that is, um, is that there's uh, no free lunch. Earthlink was very successful in promoting this program to these other cities, but it meant that they were stretched extremely thin, and uh, it made it difficult for them to focus on making one city successful before they moved on to the other ones for their own economic purposes. There's one other point here that I do want to make, and it's very important to understand in the history, and very few people r remember this, um, but remembering that all initiatives and all enterprises are uh, fundamentally uh, human. Uh, the Earthlink uh, CEO who was leading this project uh, died uh, very unexpectedly and very tragically just as this project was getting started. I see any head shaking. Is anybody aware of this? Yeah. Gary Betty was the uh, visionary Earthlink, uh, uh, visionary CEO of Earthlink. When we started this project, when I came on in July of 2006, um, they were just kind of getting started with this. And we uh, started our uh, build out in August. In September of uh, 2006, uh, Gary uh, went into the hospital. He was 49 years old, you know, a young man. And by January of 2007, he was deceased. He had a very virulent uh, form of cancer. And not to over-dramatize that, but I think it's really important to understand that these enterprises and, and initiatives are fundamentally human. And uh, the loss of the l visionary leader of Earthlink, which really was the driving economic force behind these municipal Wi-Fi projects, was a tremendous uh, blow uh, to, uh, the entire, uh, to the entire movement. Um, just a couple more comments, and then I'll, I'll, um, I'll bring it to uh, a close. Lastly, uh, I wanted to say one big problem that we did have with this project was that the technology didn't work. <laughs> And uh, uh, I probably should have said that at the beginning. <laughs> but um, you know, uh, uh, now I'm not owning that. I didn't work for Earthlink. But I certainly bought it hook, line, and sinker like everybody else did uh, at Philadelphia Magazine and elsewhere. But this project really was trying to do uh, too many things. It was very early uh, stage for uh, Wi-Fi technology, particularly the issue of delivering uh, broadband quality uh, signal into the interior of homes through a Wi-Fi signal we all thought was going to work, and it really didn't work. And so all of the problems that, so that really was the fundamental and underlying problem at this time, was that Wi-Fi technology really was a difficult vehicle upon which to, uh, you know, in which to travel uh, down this road. And so the, the, that being the, the main problem, all of these other challenges cascaded sort of upon it. If the technology had worked fine, I think we would have been able to weather all of these other storms. But the lack, the fundamental inability of the technology to achieve the ultimate, the, the goals of the project uh, really made it difficult. 
However, that said, what this really means is that it was a beta project. This is 2006 we're talking about now. It's five full years ago. We started visioning this project going all the way back to 2004. And uh, even though there's a big company that you may have heard of that has its headquarters in Philadelphia, it's not Time Warner, <laughs> uh, had a lot to say about this project and its stupidity. I actually have um, an email to that effect from the executive uh, vice president uh, of Comcast, a personal email uh, when I first started on this job, talking about how stupid this project was and then, you know, very good humor. Um, if you look at what Comcast is doing now, uh, what they're doing looks very similar to what the Wireless Philadelphia Project was promoting. Xfinity is being offered up and down uh, the corridor as uh, an add-on uh, service to people who um, uh, are Comcast subscribers. And then through the NBCU uh, deal, I don't know exactly the internal workings of this, but two and a half million low-income families are going to be receiving a program that looks a lot like Wireless Philadelphia's digital inclusion program around uh, the delivery of computers, access, uh, training, and support uh, through their qualification for the federal school free lunch program. So um, the last thing I wanted to say was that, um, I think I can say this in this crowd, I'm Jewish. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I was always raised that, you know, go someplace and not bring a gift. And so <laughs> I, um, I, when I came, uh, Denise, uh, who organized the panel, told me not to bring anything, but I couldn't help myself. So I brought you all um, a present, and this is the last lesson that I want to leave you. I think a lot of people are going to know about this already, but I wanted to lean on my friend Bob Praviti, who's here, to pass out the little gift that I have for you. And this is called the Gartner's Hype Cycle. Is anybody <laughs> familiar with the Gartner's Hype Cycle? Because if there's not a lesson, I don't know what it is. And rather than, I didn't have the technology set up to put it up, but I'm going to pass this out real quick. And to me, this really kind of sums it up. Oh, here, you can have, <laughs> you guys can have mine. Well, Bob, here, I need three up here real quick. <laughs> so I can remember. Thanks. OK. So Gardner's hype cycle. This is just one of the most, uh, uh, Gardner's uh, uh, a technology uh, research group. And you're supposed to look at this with a sense of humor, but it's also actually true. You look at the uh, chart and its visibility on the left-hand side and time on the right. The technology trigger is the first thing that happens, right? So we had Wi-Fi technology. It s exploded into a uh, visibility, which Gartner refers to as the peak of inflated, notice the adjective, <laughs> peak of inflated expectations. Then there's this tremendous crash, uh, which uh, bottoms out in the trough uh, of disillusionment. And uh, then we all get our opportunity to uh, slowly trudge up the slope of enlightenment. And then we get to walk uh, very smoothly along the uh, plateau of productivity. And I think uh, that's a really uh, good, uh, a good way to describe uh, what we are trying to do with uh, the Wireless Philadelphia Project. And hopefully we're on that plateau of uh, productivity today. So uh, uh, with uh, thanks to uh, Gartner, that's your gift. <laughs> That's great. And then, obviously, we could talk about <laughs> everything that went wrong with Philadelphia and what we could do right here in New York City for the next uh, five years. But very quickly, you know, if you do, uh, as I did, if you do a search for wireless Philadelphia. Right. I don't do that. <laughs> I, I read that. I think I read that article. And I think, was that the one that uh, it equated, like, going into Atlanta or the, the birthplace of Coke and saying Pepsi is going to be the official drink? Going into Philadelphia where Comcast is king and saying, Earthling's going to be a, and that kind of set it off. You know, it certainly didn't <laughs> set it on the right path. I mean, look, it's obvious that, um, you know, Comcast is a very powerful company in the country. It's one of the, you know, most, most important players in the country. And it's the, the single major, most significant corporate player in the city of Philadelphia. So uh, with its headquarters there and all that. And just to, you know, just to be straightforward about it, I think, you know, to say that Comcast was displeased by this project, I think, is just a sort of a straightforward thing to say. And, uh, you know, and to say, I mean, I could tell you other things. <laughs> I could say other things about it. But let's just say they were extremely displeased. And that made it a very difficult, um, you know, road to hoe. With all of the, you know, again, if all of these other things had worked, it might have been a different story. But with that, it still would have been, you know, a difficult, a difficult challenge. But also, I think it would be unfair 
um, if I were to only single out uh, Comcast uh, for that particular um, award, because um, you know Verizon uh, had an awful lot to do with this seriously, you know as well. And uh, there, I, I wish I could remember. I have one of these memories. I put bad <laughs> things out of my mind, you know. Once I kind of you know move through them, but other folks who study this stuff, you know, more than I do, might remember that you know Verizon actually went to the state legislature and uh, what bill number, whatever it was, and actually uh, once the Wireless Philadelphia project uh, went forward, they made it impossible for any other community. The compromise was that okay, Philadelphia's project can go forward, but no other community in Pennsylvania is going to be able to you know to institute. And it was really Verizon. Uh, you know that that did that, and that uh, that law is still in place. So we we were up against a lot. Well, really quickly before I move to the other two, uh, obviously provided it, it works. If you had to give a one, if if you were brought in to start this project in New York City, what would be your first step? What would you do differently just to get it started? You know, I think I I don't know the politics here. You know, uh, well enough. I would just say, um, you know, in Philadelphia, it's. I never would have thought, let me, let me say it this way. When I went in and took this job, this was like the coolest job in Philadelphia. Bob, am I right? Like, everybody's like, how'd you get that job? That's like the coolest <laughs> job in Philadelphia. Well, it turned really, it turned, for the Phillies, isn't it it? yeah, well, that would be uh, cooler, uh, Karen Cliff Lee's back. But, um, and so, you know, I think one of the things that we saw was that the, you know, it's, it, it's tricky because I, I don't really, honestly, I don't really know the answer, and I'm curious to know what you all think and, you know, what you all think. Who would have thought that having, you know, top-level mayoral support, you know, $20 million of private investment, the media behind it, and the, you know, the entire public going, this is great, yay for Philadelphia, who would have thought that all those things, you know, would have turned on us? So I'd hate to think that the lesson is don't have top level political support, don't have private <laughs> investment, don't have an ambitious agenda, right? I mean, I think, I think it's not the right, it, you know what I mean? So I, I, don't know the, I don't know the answer, but I do think that, I think I give our, our mayor at the time a tremendous amount of credit. He really wanted to address you know, a lot of problems and he, you know, he stepped out very early on. And I think it took a lot of chutzpah to, you know, to say, you know, we're going to do something big and we're going to do something first. You know, here we are in New York. You know, Philadelphia doesn't have that reputation. And everyone was very excited at that time that we were the city that was actually ahead of New York in this particular case and ahead of Boston. We were ahead of Seattle and San Francisco, you know, on this. So I, I don't know. I mean, you could argue that maybe it would be better to have started smaller and to scale down your expectations and do a neighborhood beta and all that. But then you don't get the, all the stuff that you get from actually trying to you know, take a big swing and hit the ball out of the park once in a while. I don't know. It's all up to you guys <laughs> to decide. Reminds me of uh, once upon a time New York One and CNN were sister stations, and they'd bring all the new technology to New York One, let it all crash and screw up on us, let us <laughs> iron out the kinks, and right. then, then they'd roll it out to CNN. Right. So with all due respect, maybe Philadelphia will be the New York One to the New York CNN. Well, I hope you guys, <laughs> when you figure it out, you know, get it right, and I'll be happy to keep it with you along the way. Sorry, I want to jump to you, because you've done some work uh, overseas with setting up entire cities or entire towns as Wi-Fi hotspots. Is there anything culturally uh, that you're seeing over there that's making it work better, more smoothly than, than what we're doing over here? Well, first off, somebody gave you the wrong information. <laughs> Because well, One Economy has set up a lot of community-based and work here domestically, and that's where we have learned our best practices. But we do have a lot of work overseas. And our work, though, overseas is very much in developing countries, and so it's limited to how you can actually get the Internet there. So the broadband is very similar to what you're doing right now in parks and community centers. It's, uh, we believe that you've got to create the demand. You've got to bring relevancy and awareness to the tool and the utility, as Rachel spoke about, in order for the supply to get there. But in Rwanda, there's not a lot of infrastructure. Um, but we have created, and to your point, Greg, I mean, we appreciate, One Economy appreciates the work that Philadelphia did and failed, mm -hmm. um, because we had lit up a, <laughs> a rural community in North Carolina for the first time ever that there was no broadband at all. And we took the model of Philadelphia and were, it was able to make it happen in a community well away from that nobody really cared about. And there was some dramatic impacts, um, a community that never had broadband before, um, this what was 
amazing is that county, uh, the communities like rural communities all come together. They have very limited resources. And so as soon as there was this idea, the school system turned all of their textbooks into laptops. So 3,000 laptops went home. And the county used all of their money to build the infrastructure for a county wireless. And so overnight, they went to 95% coverage and 3,000 users and it created a business model that worked and it became a utility. And the, uh, the academic and the economic indicators over five years have just continued to grow from a county that's had declining economies and um, the going to college rate was at 50%. Now 90% of the kids go to college and graduate and uh, SAT scores have gone up 41 composite points. And the most interesting thing is teen pregnancy has gone down dramatically in that community. And so it's just, a, it's just it, but it's truly that whole kind of holistic part. But I wanna um, just take, since I'm not sure, since you were talking international and everything else, that the, the part that One Economy does really well, and which we've done actually here in New York City with the Digital Divide Partnership and Urban Communications, is we, through that work, there's 25,000 people that actually have access to free Wi-Fi with NYCHA. And it's in the home, and we really believe that technology needs to come into the home. And when you're starting to figure out a solution for New York, you mustn't forget the people that are low income. Because no matter how much money you invest in the infrastructure, if they're not a part of the, of the getting online and adopting it, then it's for naught. And so with that, um, through we truly believe in relevance. And the one thing that the Digital Divide Partnership figured out was safety was a real issue in NYCHA. And so they have a wonderful technology called Video Intercom. And th through this piece of direct feed, 6,000 people each month check to see the security of the elevators. And so there's 25,000 users, there's 30,000 a month, there's a terabyte of data that goes back and forth in um, 150 low-income NYCHA properties in Bronx, Brooklyn, and Manhattan. And so it can be done, but it's truly actually understanding what the community wants and what their <laughs> issues are and what One Economy does both here domestically and abroad is sits down with the community understands what's going on, to Rachel's point, figures out what the issues are and then brings those resources in a real-time way so that they then adopt the broadband and become marketplace um, users. And so we um, appreciate the work that we've done here in particular in New York, but that's truly the model that we've done um, now. And um, Greg was at um, NTIA One Economy has been bitterly blessed with a $51 million <laughs> stimulus grant to start this effort in um, uh, 21 significant urban cities across the United States, um, which is truly working at the grassroots level in public housing, bringing shared internet access in, and providing the digital literacy and um, tools that they need to actually use it. So. Not quite exactly what you asked. <laughs> um, but I will say that what I did learn in preparation to at least bring some information to you is that different from our strategy where we've been truly committed to the whole United States and access everywhere and ubiquitous across, in a lot of um, developing countries, they've, they've leapfrogged, or as so they call it, they leapfrogged, where they've actually made huge investments in their urban core and made sure that there's high speed internet in those um, economic centers so that their countries can continue to keep pace. Whereas we've tried to do the ubiquitous and try to bring everybody online at the same time, they have limited money and have decided to truly um, invest in their um, economic cores to make it happen. And that means that we are kind of sitting there um, in the same likes of all of the old Soviet Union that kind of broke apart. We're kind of hanging out with them as we're trying to go across. They're actually beating us on the broadband quality source because they've taken a totally different strategy. Well, Dana, to uh, a little bit to some of what she was just talking about, uh, obviously no problem wiring up the public parks here in the city. Why not just wire up uh, low-income housing projects? What's, what's the difference between the two? Well, we do that. Um, the projects that we do in city parks, I wouldn't exactly call no problem. Certainly, we have fewer problems than, say, the New York City government has and in their initiative to do the same thing. Uh, and, and we could talk about that at, at, if, if, if that's the way the discussion goes. But 
fundamentally there's a difference between public space, as in outdoor space, and apartments and indoor space. Now NYCHA has its own challenges because most of NYCHA housing was built, I think, in the 70s or prior. Uh, and as a result, there's no internal cabling to be, or, or internal conduits in order to bring uh, cables that carry even cable TV. A lot of NYCHA housing doesn't even have cable TV. Uh, that may have been changed in the last year or two, but the last time I looked at it, it was uh, surprising. Um, but there's no cabling to bring internet services. And the phone lines that do exist are so ancient. Remember that mm -hmm. Verizon, or the company that's currently known as Verizon, has been building infrastructure in New York City for over 100 years. In fact, they have, uh, they, ha they had a contract with New York City, and I don't know if this is still true, but Verizon's relationship with the New York City government predates franchises. Uh, and so they've got this very, very long-standing relationship with New York City, and they've been laying down cable for over 100 years in New York City. And as New York City's grown out from, uh, from where it was in the late 1800s to now, uh, as telephone cable has been laid out, a lot of the infrastructure is just decrepit and ancient. And so you can't do things like run DSL lines uh, to get internet access in a lot of these buildings. Um, that should hopefully be changing over time with Verizon's Fios uh, plan but that's not necessarily that easy either. Uh, and you know, the, the, in some respects, what we do in public spaces in New York City is easier because we don't have to deal with you know, getting cables up and down buildings. Uh, but, <coughs> and and, and Wi-Fi in those types of buildings is problematic too because the walls are made of thick brick as opposed to today's buildings where there's, uh, where there's just studs and drywall. Uh, and the thick brick actually <laughs> blocks the signal from propagating through the building itself. So, and this is, a, this is one of the problems that uh, Greg <laughs> was referring to in terms of getting internet signal into the house uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, so, so they, wireless can be very helpful, but wireless that would today permeate a modern building would barely get in through the front door in a lot of the very old NYCHA buildings. Um, and so I yep. think the strategy that One Economy's used with that with our partners <coughs> is the kind of a shared signal. It's a, an open mesh network. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that all places in a, a, a unit from all four corners, but typically in every unit, there is access significantly to where we think the computer is going to be connected. And it's a shared access because Fios is great, but when people make $8,000 a year, right. that's mm -hmm. not an affordable solution. And so we're truly have are creating this adoption, what we call a, a, an on-ramp to broadband, um, typically not seen as competitive in the telecos. In fact, usually they're the ones that actually support us and give us the resources to make it happen. But it gets, it whets their appetite. Um, everybody has resources. They just need to understand that the broadband and this new economy is for them and that they need to figure out how to, how to make it happen. So yeah. um, the it has changed. We used to pull wires and pull data cables with UTV, and now <laughs> we're doing Meraki wireless and point-to-point, uh, -point and it makes it a little bit easier and uh, not, as a, not as costly. Yes. And that, that <laughs> it's probably orders of magnitude less expensive to do it that way. Yeah. Um, the, you know, what we do in, in parks in New York City, and you know, I'm just actually kind of curious, who's used a laptop in a public park and gotten internet service? Can you raise your hand? Anywhere in the United States? No, no in New York City. Uh, maybe a third. So the next time anyone, <laughs> any one of you guys go out uh, or, or girls go out to a public space with your laptop, uh, open it up and see if there's wi -Fi, free Wi-Fi signals there. Not something called free public Wi-Fi, but actually nycwireless.net or one of the other uh, organizations that provides free Wi-Fi. Started in, in 2001 where we lit up <coughs> Bryant Park, but actually there's a bunch of city parks that through our efforts and through the efforts of some other uh, very enterprising organizations have uh, brought free Wi-Fi internet into the public spaces. And it happens with a box, well, at least for our technology at least, a box that's about the size of a shoe box that's mounted on uh, the rooftop of uh, in-park infrastructure or more likely a neighboring building uh, with little antennas that are no bigger than, than this iPhone facing out into the park and providing free Wi-Fi. So certainly the, the 
tools that we have to use for uh, bringing Wi-Fi to the park is, are, uh, since it's only usually one or two installations like that, it's certainly easier. Um, but we face our own issues in terms of just getting internet service into the park. Uh, mm -hmm. Rachel, you, in one of the slides that you had put up, you had mentioned that 98% of uh, New Yorkers have access to internet, and, and that's actually been, uh, it's an arguable statistic, but it's, you inter <laughs> if you're saying resident, you know, residents of New York City with, uh, have uh, internet service yes. that can be accessed yes. for their home, I think that that statistic is close to true. That doesn't represent even close to the number, or the percentage that actually use it and, and subscribe to it. But one of the biggest issues that's not addressed in all of the statistics that New York City likes to throw around is that the, there's two other huge constituents that are not ever measured. One are businesses. Now, in Manhattan, it's easy to think that most businesses have internet service, but New York City is over 300 square miles, of which most of it, the, you can probably find a business on the street, cor on the street corner of at least every, of every block in New York City. Uh, and the vast, vast majority of them do not have access. And it's really only those that are in Manhattan that can access, can even have access to the internet at their place of business. And that's because the cabling's old or Time Warner Cable doesn't provide internet service to most of those businesses. Uh, that's changing very slowly. Um, the, the other big constituent, uh, constituencies are, are really public space. And New York City has a ridiculous amount of public space. Uh, every, everyone in this room has walked through a park in the last couple of weeks, I'm sure. Uh, and one of the big problems that we have is that it's almost impossible to get internet service to a location where we can then be, use it to beam inter, wi wireless internet into a public space. If I tell you that downtown in uh, Wagner, for Wagner Park, we have a hotspot in Wagner Park, which is at the south end, it was just south of Battery Park City. Uh, beautiful park, uh, gorgeous view of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, very popular park in terms of our Wi-Fi internet service. It took four months of wrangling with Verizon to be able to get a, a, a relatively low speed internet connection over DSL there. And the, the really sad part is that that location will never see Fios, ever. Because Verizon's going to install, if I can play this out, they're going to they're gonna meet their requirements to the New York City generally. Uh, I don't have any doubt about that. But their requirement to New York City is residence. And no one lives at the building where the Wi-Fi is installed. And so therefore, there will be no Fios there. And in fact, it may not be a hotspot because once they do the Wi-Fi install, it's very possible that the existing infrastructure that provides Wi-Fi, that provides internet service over DSL there, is going to be ripped out by Verizon because their central office doesn't need to support it anymore. And there won't be any internet service that's available in that, in that park because we can't get internet to a place close enough in order to beam it in. So, as, as rosy as New York City can, has, has been over the last couple of years, and we've accomplished a tremendous amount, and you, know, you guys represent uh, you know, a lot of the different aspects of it, uh, the fight's not over, unfortunately, and there's still a huge amount of work to be done. I'm going to get you also quickly, Dana, on, because we wanted to touch on this. I know we want to talk a lot about solutions. We're going to talk about something very New York City that will not work here. It's talking about a solution in other places in the country. I think it's a pretty tech-savvy crowd. Does everyone know about what the white spaces are? So, you know, these, these spaces in between digital broadcasts that are kind of open so that they don't step on each other. And there was talk about filling those white spaces with free internet or some sort of internet uh, access. Uh, but among other reasons, <laughs> I did a story on this. Broadway, Broadway uh, shows have essentially been uh, squatting on that spectrum for their wireless mics. And they fully admitted that they've never gotten permission to do this, but, but they do it because it was open and it worked for them. So when all this talk about white space came along, they became very powerful. And uh, Dan explained that, you know, that among other reasons why that whole white space plan probably would not work in New York City. Help. Yeah, um, so, and Gail, uh, to her credit, held a, a great uh, hearing a couple of years ago on, on white spaces. Uh, the, the Broadway lobby is a very, 
powerful political organization in New York City for understandable reasons. There's a huge economy that, that they uh, support in New York City. Uh, but one of, the, one of the artifacts of the fight that they put up to prevent white space technology from being put into uh, regulation by the FCC was that, they re is that there's a requirement that there be a carve out around any location that's registered as a white space using location. And those locations are sports arenas, uh, event spaces, uh, and, and essentially any, any theaters uh, of, any, of, of most types. Uh, and it's a, it's a either five or 10 mile radius around those locations. <laughs> and you can understand now why, and, and the requirement is that no other white space devices can, you, can be used in those geographic locations. So if you're within five miles of a sporting arena, no dice. If you're within five miles of a theater, no way. And so now you can understand why in New York City, at least in, centr at least in Manhattan and, and sort of the cent more central areas of uh, the outer boroughs, uh, this is, it's just not going to be even feasible to use this technology to get internet into the, into the hands of uh, residents there. There's a secondary issue which is also, that, that's unique to white spaces. There's a secondary <coughs> issue which, uh, and Greg, you, you can, you can you know, back me up on this or not, but the second issue is one of geography for New York City. Uh, there, New York City is a uh, surprisingly 3D city when it comes to uh, wireless technology. The vast majority of the rest of the country, uh, the vast majority of cities in the rest of the country have nowhere near the concentration of high rise buildings oh, sure. throughout uh -huh. them. Uh, and, you know, yes, there are high-rise buildings in, yeah, in Philadelphia, but totally there's, different. you know, there's like a few square blocks of them, right? Uh, and if you look around, you know, downtown Brooklyn, the vast majority of Manhattan, uh, and, and a lot of other places, you know, a lot of Queens, a lot of these places have a vertical component that needs to be considered. So when you consider, you know, the sort of Wi-Fi deployments that, that Greg was talking about in Philadelphia, uh, as possible solutions in New York City, sure, but only if you live somewhere below the sixth floor. And so if you live above the sixth floor, well, now you've got a problem because the signal that propagates out from the lamp posts or wherever else you're installing the gear won't reach you. It's actually a problem for cell phones too. It's why they have cell phones on rooftops facing down uh, and why they repeat, have cell phone repeaters right. for, the, for the midtown, downtown, uh, Manhattan and, and downtown Brooklyn, uh, because the signal just doesn't 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 go up that high. Um, so you can imagine installing in in the tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of high-rise buildings in New York City, uh, internal Wi-Fi networks of, of the ilk that that uh, um, that you guys install. You know that that's a huge. We get them as a nice discount. Yeah, <laughs> nonprofit. I guess if I could just, just to respond to that or to add on to that, I think. You know, I think about the lessons of wireless Philadelphia and how it relates to this conversation. And I think it's like with anything else. I think it's important to look at the technology for what it can do and, and not to be afraid of envisioning what it might do, but to choose the appropriate technology for the purpose, right? And so there are certain things that, the, that I think Wi-Fi technology really lends itself for. Those are the things that we should focus on. If we had any, you know, what did we do wrong? We, we claimed and believed that Wi-Fi technology was going to you know, cure, do everything, including wash the dishes and cure <laughs> cancer. And so I think it's just very, very important that you know, the appropriate technology be deployed for the appropriate use. And there are multiple things that we're talking about. If you think about Rachel's uh, presentation and how it relates to all the different utilizations that people, you know, that people engage in, whether it's, um, you know, and not only how do people, uh, what do people use uh, the technology for, but how do they engage the technology? Are they mobile? Are they at home? Uh, are they in uh, semi-public space? You know, you think about 
you know, it, there's not, um, one of the things that I'm interested in is that, uh, you know, public space isn't only out in the open. You know, there's public space, certainly there are internal public spaces mm -hmm. all over uh, the city of uh, New York and the city of Philadelphia. How might those be uh, better engaged to bring people in in the bad weather or in the summertime and, you, you know, and generate uh, support for economic activity that, take place, that takes place indoors? Long way around saying it's important to focus on uh, the right use for the right technology. I, th I think this is a really important point, uh, and it's actually the central point for why NYC Wireless does what we do. Wi-Fi is great for the sort of medium-sized and small-sized city parks. It's, a, it's never going to cover the entirety of Central Park or Prospect Park, although it might cover parts of it that are, that are appropriate. But we tr really try to focus on the, the high value uh, programs that, that uh, we, can, we can bring out into the public and, uh, and uh, see them really be very successful. So that's why, uh, that's why the, the park hotspots is so, uh, has been so successful because we focused on only certain parks that would be, that are highly trafficked uh, and we, we focused on uh, building out into, you know, as many parks as we can. But you know, there are, there are projects that we'll say no to just because it's not going to really, at this point, be the right, the right venue for right. this type of technology. Uh, and so, you know, we, we, we also do, we also do uh, light up uh, newer buildings for a NYCHA, for, for a handful of NYCHA house, uh, housing locations. Um, you know, the, the, and, and we've been huge proponents and we've, we've uh, talked to the city countless times. Gail Brewer, you know, I'm sure, Gail, you, you, you have suffered through some of these discussions. <laughs> um, and, and really tried to be advocates for not, not choosing to do the smaller thing, but rather choosing to do the smart thing. Right. Uh, and to really be, be targeted in, in the work that gets done. Uh, and you know, one of the you know one of the great things that we're starting to see now is is huge benefits in terms of the economic development of New York City as a result of these projects. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, there's you know there was something like over 500 million dollars invested in venture capital last year in New York City alone, and that the vast majority of that money went to companies that were started in New York City small companies, tech, mostly technology companies that were started in New York City that were started in places like coffee shops that have Wi-Fi thanks to the early work that NYC Wireless did to, to bring this technology to the, to the forefront. Uh, co-working spaces, which are a relatively new invention, but of which New York City has uh, a few dozen. Uh, they're basically shared workspaces. Uh, that, that we've long supported and, and have worked very closely with to bring uh, internet access to those to those types of uh, locations, uh, homes, parks, and all of these other places where individuals can gather. Uh, and, and actually, I, I wouldn't be surprised if a large number of companies were dreamed up while sitting at a Wi-Fi enabled park, uh, surfing your surfing the internet on your laptop. That, that this is a generation of startup companies that are that have been built by uh, entrepreneurs and, and you know, all the other folks in, in New York City as a, you know, while they had access to free Wi-Fi in public spaces and while they used free Wi-Fi in public spaces. Um, so I think it's, I think, you know, to your point, Greg, it's this is a huge thing that you, we really need to be focused on where the technology and the programs can do the most good for the most number of people and have the biggest impact. So we are going to turn it over to uh, questions from you guys. For I had I had two other big questions I wanted to touch on, which was, you know, uh, do we go? Uh, how is it working with big ISPs versus little ISPs in terms of doing all this? And then also, when you invest in a tech, I know that's God, we talk for hours. Uh, and then also, you know, when you when you invest in a technology, by the time you get it up and running, just like all of our devices, there's something newer and better. That'll get the job done even quicker. You know, how, what is the danger of all that? But if you guys want to ask that, you can ask that. <laughs> so, uh, and, and also, uh, for the folks who are uh, municipal art society folks, I, I forget how long exactly we have, so just cut me off when we're, when we're done over here. Uh, so go ahead, any questions? Thank you very much, all of you, for sharing your insights with us. Um, 
My main question is actually for Greg. Okay. Um, you said that the utilities played a role in that, more like a service provider. Uh, was there anything more that they could have done in the support of the Philadelphia Wireless Project? Uh, yeah, I, without getting in too much into the weeds, and maybe you might respond to this a little bit or from your, your experience in working with the utilities. The, the utilities, very briefly, the utilities' role in the Wireless Philadelphia project were to provide the mounting assets for the Wi-Fi radios. Mm -hmm. So, in the way that worked, and again, not to get too deep into it, but you know, think of the old-fashioned you know street lamps, you know that co that come up like this and over like this. And if you think about it, there's a ca there's a green cap on the top. And so the Wi-Fi radio, and the, that's an electrical outlet. And so the Wi-Fi radios were attached to the arm this way, and they were literally plugged in to the top of the, of the street lights. The city, I don't know what the situation, I'd be very curious to know what the situation in the city of, Philadelphia, in the city of New York is. The Pico uh, Electric is the energy uh, company, and the bottom line of it is the way that deal worked out was that uh, the, it's hard for me to say it objectively. From their, <laughs> from their perspective, um, it was an additional use that couldn't be metered, and therefore each individual um, uh, radio had to be charged uh, a pole attachment fee and several other <coughs> fees to account for the fact that it could not be metered. And the bottom line of what it, although the pole attachment fees and all those related tariffs were already being paid by the city of Philadelphia to the utility oh. because <laughs> these are street lights. So the bottom line of it was that the uh, ultimate charges to Wireless Philadelphia to attach the Wi-Fi radios to the street lights were six times the actual cost of the actual electricity used by one of those devices. <laughs> so, I think that's I think that's being very conservative. Well, that's what current the, technology today even. That's what the actual numbers were. So whatever it was, let's say it was, I don't know, ten dollars a month, you know, per device, and you had several thousand devices deployed across the city. Only about, uh, you know, whatever the numbers are, dollar fifty of that was the actual charges, and all the other charges were non non electricity related. Um, licensing fees for the privilege of sticking the thing on top of the thing, even though those fees were already being paid by the city of Philadelphia. That's what I mean by not being a partner in the dissemination of Wi-Fi technology to the community. And the weird, there's a weird arcana around why that ended up being a cost to wireless Philadelphia, which we were, were as a nonprofit, which we were ultimately able to pay. But even with the network that was not working very well, we ended up owing the utility several hundred thousand dollars a year for uh, the ability to uh, put these things on top of the light pole. So I would say get your utility Make in the right partner. relationship yeah. with you before, I don't know what the story is here, but that was the problem there. Yeah. Is the similar situation here? Well, no, it's a much longer discussion, but the only thing I would add to you, add to what you, you said, Greg, is, and, and to your point, Adam, about the pace of evolution, so that's 19, no, sorry, 2006 te technology. Um, we've built solar powered <laughs> hotspots, Good. right? That cost this much money to run, except for the hardware, obviously. Uh, and you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is that the cost of operating a Wi-Fi network, similar to what uh, similar to what Wireless Philadelphia was, is certainly not nothing. But that hundred thousand dollars can probably be cut down by one to two orders of magnitude per year, uh, given today's new technology. Where do you put those solar? Do you have to put them on poles, well, I mean, which will then cover their own fees? For, just for, to have for, them on forget it? about the forget about the solar. Although that's a great a great solution, um, there are maintenance issues with solar Wi-Fi. But uh, but the you know the, today's Wi-Fi devices, you can you know if I can if I can have Wi-Fi on my iPhone that runs for days on end on a tiny little battery. Uh, then you can imagine that, and that those devices are not significantly more powerful in terms of their energy requirements. Uh, you know that dollar fifty you're paying per month estimated probably with with modern technology would could be down in you know it's for only a handful of cents or you know a few dozen cents 
uh, and that's just five years worth. Imagine another five Going years. Going back to the original like. problem of just sort of being out there in front and trying to make it work with the technology as, the, as it exists at the time. That's right. Oh, we got to go through some. <coughs> hey there, I'm Craig Plunkett. Um, and I <coughs> feel each, of, each one of your guys' is pain. <laughs> um, Greg, I've been working in the Wi-Fi arena since 2004, and I know what you're talking about as far as the uh, equipment and maturing. Yeah. You run a wireless ISP <coughs> out on Fire Island. Oh, great. And uh, in, to bring it around to baseball, when you build a network you, and, and you're, you're up against the big leaguers, you have to hit them where they ain't. And uh, Fire Island is a very niche market, and that's yeah. why we're successful. Um, and the other thing that you have to do when you uh, build a network is have economical uh, access to mounting assets and yeah. rights of way. And, you know, Dana and I have been doing work with NYC Wireless building hotspots for a few years now. And, uh, you know, having a cooperative partner and so many of the community does need to be involved because you have to give them something that they want. Um, what I would say to the city government is, is that there needs to be a model where you can have some kind of open access to, uh, open and non-discriminatory access to the rights of way and mounting assets um, because that's the only way you can enable competition and build uh, you know, viable providers because you have to have a sustainable business model. Yeah. Right. All right, so I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that. Down over here. Hi, my name is Bruce Lincoln. I'm from Columbia University. And one of the things I want to talk about is this idea of how do we achieve the ultimate goal, which is ubiquitous broadband in New York City. And I think one of the things we have to do is change the conversation. I mean, we can't compete against the telcos, so we have to figure out how we can work with them. So I think we need to change this. And one of the things we've done is create this thing called advanced community broadband. The idea being, let's take this outside of a conversation of trying to provide telecommunications services but looking at it as a life critical, mission critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And then going back to what Sony says, then you look at the relevancy. And one of the key areas is Wi-Fi or wireline is very important as far as uh, the implementation of the green economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's an important area where, once again, we have to look at low income communities, we have to tie them into the green economy. But when you look at those sorts of ideas, you can start to get the telcos you know, working along with you. And then another key application, looking at relevancy, is telework. The idea is that everyone has to be on the network because the idea is we're now delivering jobs to your device. Mm -hmm. And they're doing this um, through a company called Microtask in Finland. They're doing it in Africa. And so we also can do that here in the United States if we start to look at who's unbanked, who's still underemployed. So then that makes Wi-Fi a very compelling technology where you can figure out how to craft uh, a partnership and a collaboration, you know, across the telcos, across other technology companies, and with nonprofits. So I think that's another sort of strategy we need to think through. Does anybody have a, a question, an actual question? <laughs> that's great, great comments. Hi, I'm uh, Marshall Brown. Um, I'm first of all about Wi-Fi to uh, major parks here in the city. Uh, 18 locations, 10 parks, four boroughs. Contemporaneous is what you were doing. I, again, I feel your pain. Uh, we have to drink some time to discuss. Um, uh, more recently, I've uh, set up Wi-Fi networks for uh, business improvement districts, uh, Times Square and Union Square, and uh, been viewing the controversy about uh, you know, Time Warner and Cablevision's propos proposition to roll out Wi-Fi to 32 more parks and thinking about how we could perhaps do this different. And, uh, I was wondering, I've heard uh, about uh, NYC.gov uh, and what it's doing and, and open data and all. Um, what do you think of this? <laughs> Putting a local server on these networks, which would have all the city information, community intranets. You, know, you want people to access the information first. It gets their wire speed. Um, and then, obviously, you have to have some uplinks to the internet. But it, it's really not about access so much as getting people the information that, that's useful to them. Education, health, uh, what's happening in, in local businesses. Um, I'm curious if, if uh, those sort of deployments would uh, perhaps smooth the way. For instance, in the parks, we could put a 
a local server for, for Time Warner and Cablevision's networks and whitelist whatever city websites you want to have people access for free. And if people wanted to further bounce out to the web, maybe then recharge. But the city information should be free. You should talk to the, there are Wi-Fi NY guys sitting two rows behind you <laughs> who pretty much, uh, from my conversation with them, do exactly that, right? <laughs> I, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a proposal that's been floated, uh, I, don't, I can't tell you how many different times in the past, and every single time it's been floated, it's never really addressed the fundamental issue, which is, uh, and, and Rachel, I think, is, is smiling about this, uh, the <laughs> not, not about the, the fact that it hasn't worked, but so much of city information is real time. So much of everything that she's been talking about, about nyc.gov, is real time information. And, the, the key is making sure that everyone, wherever they are in New York City, can access the real-time web for New York City information if we're talking about access to municipal services. But that's only a small part of the problem. The, the really big problem is that to be a proper digital citizen, to be fully enfranchised with the, you know, what's going on in this country, to, to, to be part of the, you know, the development of the economy, to be, uh, to be informed as a, as a citizen, you need access to 100% of the internet. Not 10%, not 20%, not 5%, not the part that Time Warner Cable decides or Cablevision decides or New York City decides to make available to you. It doesn't help. What helps is 100% of the internet, 100% of the time, and a lot of what we, what we do is in public spaces, those same spaces that you access for your tax dollars and that you, give, you make available to visitors to New York City for free, Wi-Fi in those spaces should be free. Internet service, wireless internet service, 100% of it should be free because that's what helps this city grow as a, as a single collective uh, organism. Uh, and, and it's what helps build the economy in this city and it's what, helps, uh, it's what helps bring all of the people, low income to high income, online together uh, making use of these resources. And I, I gotta tell you, I, I love the, the work that One Economy does because some, we have a couple of hotspots that we helped create downtown and including one that's indoors at, on Wall Street, that have a very vibrant homeless population that actually help to take care of the space and camp out there during the day because it has electricity and it has free Wi-Fi. And they have netbooks and they get online and they blog and they do, work and they do their research and some of them actually make money sitting, you know, homeless folks sitting in a public space accessing the internet. There, there was actually a thesis that was written by uh, one of our board members, a woman by the name of Laura Forlano, mm -hmm. uh, that where she actually went around and interviewed all of these people. And it's absolutely fascinating, not, not just the homeless folks, but also the, all of the digital workers, but it's absolutely fascinating how engaging free Wi-Fi in, in, a, in a public space or semi-public space can be for promoting exactly the types of things that we want to see happen in our economy and in our culture. I just want to add uh, to that. I have one last, one add last to question. Oh, go ahead. Okay, thank you. There is going to be a reception afterwards. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Doug Frazier, and um, I am with uh, partners with uh, One Economy and uh, uh, Tana, we talked on the phone. Um, I'm the engineer, and we run the Digital Divide Partnership, and we built the Lifeline Network. My question is to you, Rachel, uh, which is very big. Our group, uh, you know, I'm an old, old guy, I'm 60 years old. We've had, we have spent, uh, I think we went the venture capital route. We, we raised over three or four million dollars in venture capital. Well, actually more than seven million dollars, which is pretty loud for two guys who don't even have a car. <laughs> and three million dollars of that we gave to the city in fees as part of being the only, I think, minority group that has the franchise in the city of New York, we're the only guys that have ever had one in 17 years. We've never gotten any business from the city. And, <clears throat> and that's not surprising to most people in this room, given you know, who we are. But my question to you, since you know, you're young, and uh, I have a daughter your age, so I'm hoping, <laughs> that you know, will the city 
take, because I agree with Dana, I think the, uh, we need to have uh, free internet access for everyone, not just the people in the parks, not just the people in downtown buildings, but everywhere there should be free internet. You can't get 311, a wonderful service that you have. You can't get it unless you pay somebody. You can't, if the kid goes to school, he cannot get, look at, uh, check his homework and, 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 and see what grades he has, because they have some wonderful programs at the schools, and they can't check any of those things unless you pay, pay somebody. somebody. Mm -hmm. You have to pay a private company in order to do that. The city spends a lot of money on Intercom. I got to, I'm just going to show you this. You can look at this later. <laughs> That's an app that I created along with our team for the housing authority to allow the poor people in, in the housing authority to look at the lobbies and see the cameras. They use it for broadband. And when the economy gave us the equipment, we did a park. So they, they don't talk about a park. We did Riverbank State Park, which has two million view, uh, visitors every, every year. It's the only state park in the, host, in the state of New York that has free Wi-Fi. We put that in with, with, with the help of one economy. We, start, we did a, the first uh, Wi-Fi hotspot in the Bronx with um, Gail Brewer. What was that, 2004, Gail? 2004. So when he was talking about, uh, when he was talking about uh, devices that can penetrate the house, we have a Roboto antenna that was specially designed by the FCC that allowed you to penetrate. We have one of those. Somebody gave it to us. They didn't know how to work it. They gave it to us. We got it working. It's on 149th Street and 3rd Avenue, deep in the South Bronx. That application that you saw, that we put that together to help people to learn how to use broadband because people who, as I was telling the young man earlier, young man, that a lot of people in the communities are not that smart, but they know they're not that smart. A lot of people in the community are not that educated. They know they're not that educated. They know they're not going to have a chance. But Wi-Fi and the whole digital network is one of the few things that we have in this country where everybody has to learn how to read. It's probably one of the greatest things we've ever all, all seen, the internet. And that's why we have this conversation. So I want to know what, I hate you. I just want to know <laughs> what. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be I real? Wanna know, yeah. I want to know what the city is going to do in you and your position to help, I'm sorry for surpassing the panel. What you're going to do to have some equality in the way the city uh, provides services into some of these other communities. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so to the, the question is, um, what is the city going to do to provide the <coughs> services? No, when are you going to use some of the, uh, the uh, broadband spend that you give to Verizon, two to five hundred million a year, when are you going to take some of that money and spread it out amongst the community? Right. <laughs> so I just wanted to, uh, I mean, I should preface this, that I'm just getting started. This is... Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a good, good timing. First, I want to applaud you for what you're doing because it's very important. Um, and it's bringing access to people who truly need it. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, coming from the private sector, this is, you know, entering um, the public sector, there are, are enormous rules and regulations around procurement and how the government spends its money because it's taxpayer dollars and they're created for very good reasons to make sure that everything, you know, is above board. Um, but I think that's an uh, extremely important point, and I think that um, it, we need to be supporting economic development in New York City, and um, I'm happy to uh, speak with you. Okay. Thanks. We could keep going, but we're not, right? <laughs> yeah, because time is <coughs> up. Um, uh, thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Adam and Dana and Greg and Sonia. Thank you, Rachel and Gail. Uh, thanks uh, for those of you who uh, asked very important and timely questions. Uh, thank you for coming this evening. Uh, there, is a re there are refreshments out in the lobby, so please stay and uh, join us and talk and ask these guys more questions. Please check out uh, MAS.org for information on programs we have coming up. April is Streets Month uh, at MAS and in New York City. We've got some... Uh, very important uh, conversations planned for the month of April and much, much more. So thank you. Thanks, you guys.